Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? Good. Yeah, good. I like that enthusiasm. I thought maybe that was uh, a family member who was leading the applause. Thank you very much. I want to get your name and number. <laughs> well, thank you all for uh, coming out and spending um, an hour or so of your day. Um, and uh, obviously, a meal is always uh, an inducement. Uh, and thank you, Jason, uh, to and your colleagues for uh, an excellent uh, lunch and a healthy lunch. Um, but also for the opportunity to talk with you about work that is near and dear to my heart and frankly that's near and dear to all of our hearts. That's why we're here. Uh, we care about the health and well-being of the people of California and uh, we come together at a time of um, tremendous opportunity, excitement, uh, and considerable uncertainty. Uh, it, it is interesting to be having a conversation about health reform. Um, it's just, uh, what, last month that we celebrated um, or some um, maybe didn't celebrate, but it marked the two-year uh, enactment of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and then just last week, there was that remarkable three days of hearings, um, of proceedings before the US Supreme Court, talking about the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. And when we look around the country, we see some states that are really um, holding back and are being very um, cautious in terms of whether or not to move forward pending uh, a decision by the Supreme Court. Others are holding back and waiting to see what happens um, in the context of the fall uh, elections. Um, but other states are moving forward. And we happen to be, uh, I believe, um, to have the good fortune of being in a state where our elected officials, shortly after federal health reform was enacted two years ago, put in place many of the key building blocks um, to enable um, California to establish a foundation upon which reform would be implemented uh, at the state level. And one of those building blocks was the health benefit exchange, which represents, uh, in my mind, a really exciting uh, opportunity to extend coverage to millions of individuals and families um, throughout our state. Now, we acknowledge, we have to acknowledge the elephant in the living room. I mean, there is a lot of uncertainty um, in terms of the courts, in terms of the campaigns, in terms of the presidential um, election. Um, but I start by underscoring that the problems, the issues, um, both economic and very, very human and personal. The issues that gave rise to federal health reform to begin with are problems, are issues that really uh, persist. So from the perspective of the exchange, I want to start by underscoring that we are very much focused on implementation. We are focused on staying the course and moving ahead um, with standing up a Cal California's health benefit exchange uh, until such time as the external operating environment um, changes. So what is an exchange? When I think of the exchange, I think of words like uh, consumer empowerment. I think of choice. I think of healthy competition. An exchange, in many respects, is like um, uh, travelocity or orbits. It's this idea of creating an online marketplace um, through which millions of consumers will be able to shop for insurance, to be able to compare plans and purchase a coverage that meets their needs. Um, we are fortunate, as I said, to be in a state where our policymakers understood that an exchange offers considerable value to improving access, improving coverage, improving health um, for the people of California. Um, so what is an exchange? What kind of tool or marketplace um, is it? Well, first off, the idea behind an exchange is to, to serve as a pooling mechanism, to give individuals and small businesses the same kind of purchasing power and choice among competing plans as individuals who work for large businesses or who work for, for the government, um, the same kind of benefits and choice that they uh, enjoy. Secondly, an exchange is a gateway to coverage. Um, reform, just to remind everyone in terms of its structure, uh, one of the overarching goals of federal health reform is to ex achieve near universal coverage and to do so through a number of mechanisms, one of which is to expand state Medicaid programs or what we refer to as Medi-Cal in California. So we're going to get rid of all those different categorical requirements, and we're going to create a single income base for eligibility, up to 138% of poverty. The exchange represents a new market for those individuals between 138 and 400% of poverty. That translates to about $32,000 to $90,000 a year for a family of four. Those individuals who fall in that 138 to 400% of poverty income range will be eligible for an advanceable tax credit. And what that means is that, and, and that tax credit can only be used through the exchange. So the exchange is the sole mechanism where that tax credit can be used to purchase insurance and to comply with the requirement, the mandate, 
uh, that most people buy insurance. And I underscore it's advanceable. So as you go through the eligibility process, and I'll talk about this a bit more in a moment, if it's determined that you are eligible for a tax credit, that tax credit will be advanced to you at the front end to support your ability uh, to purchase insurance. Our policymakers understood that the exchange properly designed and executed can contribute to a much healthier, innovative, and competitive marketplace where health plans are competing actively for the business of, of, of consumers and doing so on the basis of the cost of their products, the quality of the products, the service that they provide. Today, under our existing market rules, a lot of the competition, frankly, among plans is to avoid risk or to select and find the healthier risk consistent with what the rules currently provide. So the rules are going to change with the Affordable Care Act, um, and the exchange represents a marketplace that focuses competition in a much more healthy way, literally and figuratively, on cost and value. Um, and finally, the exchange, um, our, under, our policymakers understood the exchange really can provide value to its members in terms of improving their access to more affordable, higher quality coverage um, by actively negotiating, actively purchasing on behalf of its members. Um, what does that mean in practice? You know, this term active purchasing is a term that's often used. It means that our exchange has the authority to establish standards for plans to participate in the exchange that exceed the federal minimums. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But it's a very important authority that our state elected officials conferred to the exchange board. And it provides us, all of us, with an opportunity to think about what are the goals we are endeavoring to advance in terms of quality improvement, affordability, and delivery system reform? And how might the exchange use its ability to be an active purchaser to establish state plan participation standards um, to achieve that goal? So what's the context um, for our work? Um, it's a context that I think all of us in this room in different ways are a part of. Uh, we have millions of Californians who are uninsured, millions of more who are underinsured. Um, the focus of our work, in many respects, are those people who are uninsured. Um, and so that, that light orange wedge represents um, that portion, roughly 14% of our population, that currently is without coverage. But because the exchange sees its role as part of this broader fabric, of health insurance um, and health care. We're also concerned about those two other wedges, the, the, the orange wedge, uh, those individuals who are in the individual market, um, for whom coverage is often extraordinarily expensive, um, as well as those individuals in the small group. Um, so in light of this, our, our, how we see ourselves in the broader marketplace, we really also care very much about not only the uninsured, but also individual, those in the individual and small group markets and their ability to access affordable quality coverage. So we start as um, just underscoring the coverage context and the exchange as a, as a gateway to more affordable, comprehensive coverage. The other context is cost. Um, you know, there are so many different ways to measure healthcare spending. Um, there's so many uh, data points we can point to to underscore our alarm um, at the uh, relentlessly increasing cost of healthcare. Um, healthcare spending is a percentage of our nation's gross d domestic problem. Pro um, um, <laughs> That's actually a really good. It is a gross. Uh, healthcare spending is a, a significant problem as it relates to its growing share of our gross domestic product. Um, but also looking at total government costs uh, dedicated to healthcare. Uh, looking at employee compensation. Um, those of us who are fortunate enough to have health coverage through um, our place of employment, that is a form of our, our compensation and oftentimes a, a source of compensation that um, is increasingly expensive to employers and has implications for wage growth um, or, or lack thereof. Uh, we look at employers' bottom line in terms of uh, what, what their overall allocations are and what are our out-of-pocket expenditures and how those are growing uh, extraordinarily. So regardless of how you measure um, health care costs, I think we can all agree that costs are growing at a rate that really is unsustainable. And so the exchange here as well we believe has an opportunity, has an obligation to look at ways whereby we can contribute to a slowing of the rate of healthcare um, spending in our state. When our exchange um, board convened and um, the legislation that our policymakers uh, enacted in the fall of 2010 um, established a five member governing board. So I am one of five members. Um, we are what's characterized as an independent government agency. What does that mean? That means we're not a part of any existing uh, agency or department. We are certainly a part of government. We operate according to government um, processes and procedures. 
We have some um, uh, flexibilities around contracting and hiring to enable us to stand up our operations uh, quickly and to be competitive with an outside marketplace. Um, and as an independent board, we operate in um, public session. So we are a, a very uh, accessible uh, and we believe accountable um, uh, governing body. So when our exchange was fully constituted last July, one of the first things we did was um, talk about, so what are we? You know, what is our role in the marketplace? Um, and to use that conversation to inform development of our overarching vision, our mission, uh, and our operating uh, principles. So just quickly to touch on, because I think it's, a, it's an important piece of our, of our work and how we think of our role in the marketplace. Um, we effectively looked at four different paradigms, if you will. Um, and with the support of the California Healthcare Foundation, some uh, research papers were developed, some super smart people, or how I refer to them as super smarty pants, came and <laughs> met with the exchange board and, and kind of assumed the position of each of these four visions. And so the price leader model is basically saying, you know what, the exchange, our role, it's all about price. It's about negotiating the lowest premium possible and providing the most affordable uh, products that we can to those individuals and small businesses that will be purchasing through uh, the exchange. So a very price-focused orientation was what that model, that vision was about. Um, an alternative model was to say, no, you know, it's really about being a one-stop shop for consumers, from, from uh, nuts to soup, or what is it, Nut, both, soup to nuts. There we go, soup to nuts. Uh, soup to nuts, it is all about the consumer experience and everything you do needs to be consumer friendly and, and responsive to the tremendous uh, diversity of the consumers in the California marketplace. Um, a third line of thought was, you know, affordability is important, but you know, if you negotiate really low rates, those are often just one year, maybe two year uh, gains. And yes, consumer friendliness is, is critical, but it's really about the exchange being a catalyst, the exchange being a change agent. The exchange using its role in the marketplace to really advance and influence and shape the underlying uh, financing and delivery of healthcare and really get at some of those underlying drivers that affect cost and quality and health disparities. And finally, there was a school of thought that said, you know, it really is about your partnerships with your big brother, Medi-Cal. Um, exchange may be the shiny new ornament, as I call it, you know, the new kid on the block. Uh, there's a lot of hope and promise for what the exchange can do. Um, which I share, but this line of thought says, you know, it's really about Medi-Cal, which is covering 7 million people today, another 2 to 3 million people with the expansion come 2014. And so everything we do really needs to be very closely aligned um, with our, our Medi-Cal and, and Healthy Families uh, partners. At the end of the day, not surprisingly, uh, the Exchange Board, and this was a very interesting and important and, and rich public discussion we had, you know, in many respects ultimately concluded, we have to be a little bit of all of those things. Right? So when we stand up for the first time, when we open our doors come January 2014, we have to offer products that people are going to want to buy, that offers them value in terms of cost and quality and customer service. So we have to focus on price. We have to focus on a, a first class customer experience. Otherwise, we're going to lose people. This is a competitive marketplace. This is a competitive marketplace. So the consumer orientation has to be a thrust in everything we do. Um, the aspiration about being a change agent. Maybe that's not going to happen out of the blocks, but over time, the board said, this is core to who we are about and what we aspire to be. Because while coverage is an essential goal in what we do, we have to play a role in contributing to the underlying drivers of cost and health status um, that are so critical to, to our state um, today and its future. Uh, and finally, the board recognized that we are not an island unto ourselves. And we have to work in a very collaborative and aligned way as much as possible um, with our Medi-Cal partners and, and healthy families. So it's a matter of emphasis. It's a matter of degree. Uh, it's also a matter of sequencing. But, but it was a very rich and important conversation um, that, that we had that underformed um, the next undertaking we, we pursued uh, this past summer. And that was to do what any new organization needs to do, should do. Um, and that is to um, talk about what is our overarching vision, mission, and principles. Um, our vision you see here is to improve the health of all Californians by assuring their access to affordable, high-quality care. Um, the emphasis on all, even though we will not be serving all, 
The emphasis on all underscores the exchange board and staff's belief uh, and recognition that we are a part of a broader ecosystem of coverage and care. And we need to think about the decisions we make in that broader context. We are not an island. We are part of a broader system of coverage and care that it aspires to improve access, uh, improve health outcomes, improve quality and affordability. Um, our mission um, is squarely focused on increasing uh, coverage. Uh, but as I noted, we also see our role in terms of creating this innovative competitive marketplace is advancing not only the goal of expanded coverage, but also using our purchasing power to influence and shape the market, to influence and shape delivery systems, um, to get at some of these issues around cost, health disparities, uh, and quality. We articulated a number of values uh, to, under, to undergird our work. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I would emphasize it begins with the consumer um, and recognizing uh, the imperative for us to offer uh, a consumer-friendly, first-class experience uh, that recognizes the cultural, linguistic, economic, educational, and health status diversity of the people we serve. So the consumer is, is at the forefront in all of their, with all of their wonderful diversity. Um, and it ends with results. Uh, a recognition that, that we need to be held accountable for what we do. And that accountability, as I noted, we really do, do believe, um, needs to be in the context of not only coverage expansion, um, but also in terms of quality uh, and cost. So let me say a word about our, our timeline. Um, when I worked, uh, had the good uh, fortune of working uh, in the Schwarzenegger administration and um, uh, was able to work with my colleagues, um, both within the administration and the external stakeholder community on initial planning um, back in 2012, 2012? No, 2010. Uh, it seemed like just yesterday. Um, our mantra was 2014 is tomorrow. We had buttons made and we thought it was kind of clever and cute. In 2014, it seems so far away, but we also recognized there was so much to do. Um, now here we are in April of 2012. 2014 is absolutely tomorrow. Uh, the timelines associated with standing up reform broadly, standing up a brand spanking new health benefit exchange specifically are, are daunting. Um, this gives you a picture of, of some of the major milestones. Um, uh, Affordable Care Act, as we know, was enacted just a couple years ago, uh, almost uh, two years to the day. Uh, I say with great pride that we were the first state to enact uh, legislation creating a health benefit exchange in the nation following enactment of the Affordable Care Act. And that says something, because we all read in the newspaper, we hear on the radio, uh, we watch on television about the uh, asserted dysfunctions of our policy processes, processes and decision-making efforts. And our elected officials really stepped up, really stepped up and have demonstrated national leadership in putting those critical statutory building blocks in place, including the, the nation's first health benefit exchange. Um, we set out immediately to secure federal funding to help um, support um, the initial uh, expenses associated with moving an exchange forward. So we secured what's called a level one establishment grant, which is another it's a federal term for implementation. Don't know why the feds didn't think implementation was the right word, but uh, we have a whole new set of acronyms that we're all coming, uh, becoming familiar with. Um, so we have roughly $40 million for our initial planning activity. Our next major milestone in terms of securing federal support is coming up uh, at the end of June. And our goal is to su submit what's called a level two uh, uh, establishment grant, which is going to be a very significant grant will, which will support implementation, uh, the further planning, design, and implementation of the exchange through 2014. And consistent with federal law, January 1, 2015, the exchange has to be self-sustaining. So major, major milestones. Um, I'll return in a moment to um, the, the one uh, milestone I, I didn't mention, and that is uh, the expectation that by the fall of 2013, we will be opening uh, enrollment. Um, so the fall of next year, we will have uh, choices available, what we call qualified health plans, or QHPs, which will be made available with um, the start date of coverage uh, taking effect January 1 of 2014. So. Um, those, I don't know if anyone's been perhaps watching a little bit of the exchange. Um, we meet in public, as I said. We're also uh, webcasting um, our uh, meetings, so they're uh, avail accessible to those who are unable to come to Sacramento, or we're now actually going on the road, which has been uh, great fun and very edifying. Um, 
But if you follow our, our meetings and proceedings, you get a sense of the scope, the diversity, the complexity of um, the, 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 the number of the decisions uh, and issues that we are grappling with um, as an exchange board. Um, I'm going to spare you uh, going through all of these issues. Uh, but what I do want to share with you this afternoon is I want to principally focus on two of the, the major areas of decision making that are really critical to um, our collective ability to advance the goals of the health benefit exchange in terms of, access, in terms of coverage, access, uh, and health improvement. So first, I want to start with um, something that I, I think everyone in this room has probably experienced with in, in different ways, and, and that is the challenges around outreach and education um, and enrollment. And we talk a lot about the vision of the Affordable Care Act in terms of expanded coverage, improved access, uh, seamless coordinated care, uh, improvements in health status, advances in health equity. None of that is going to come to be if we are not successful in getting people to enroll, right? So the, this fabulous hope and promise that, that no doubt is reflective of goals all of us in different ways have worked to advance throughout the courses of our careers. The hope and the promise of, of reform is really going to amount to much until people are aware of and enrolled in plans that are, are consistent with um, their, their needs and circumstances. Now, this represents, in my mind, one of the most extraordinary opportunities that federal reform provides states. The vision of federal reform around enrollment, around eligibility determination, is markedly different than how government programs have historically been structured and implemented. Right? Anyone who's had an opportunity to interact with government knows that the words customer-friendly government experience isn't really, all, those words don't always flow together. And it's not because um, state employees and county employees don't endeavor to make it so. It's because the rules, as much as anything, are extraordinarily complicated. You know, what we ask county eligibility workers to do is, is remarkable in terms of the complexity and, and difficulty of all these different rules, but the world is changing. And so the vision of the Affordable Care Act is this idea of a no wrong door, that people can connect to coverage through multiple pathways, through county welfare offices, through schools, through community-based organizations, through providers, through call centers, through online technology, through smartphones. So it's this idea of no wrong door, real-time eligibility determination and enrollment. That's a powerful vision for those of us who care about connecting people to coverage. And it is markedly different than how government programs run today. So that's the opportunity. We have an opportunity to really rethink and recreate how we approach eligibility and enrollment. Now, it is a challenging environment. We've got lots of computer systems we're going to need to integrate. We've got a very labor and paper intensive process that we're going to need to streamline. You know, we've got plan choices that we're going to really need to simplify for people consistent with the diversity uh, of consumers. Um, we've got an environment of a lot of misinformation, a lot of mistrust, a lot of fear that we're going to need to overcome. We've got millions of people who are uninsured, who are extraordinarily diverse. And they've got significant cultural and linguistic uh, issues that we're going to need to be uh, sensitive to. Uh, we've got issues associated with populations that maybe have never had any interaction with coverage before. They may not have a regular source of care. Very, very hard to reach populations. So it's a challenging environment, but the exchange really has an opportunity to really knock down those, those barriers. And it's not just the exchange alone. We work in concert um, with our partners at the Department of Healthcare Services and the Managers Medical Insurance Board. This is shared planning, shared implementation around outreach and enrollment uh, and redetermination because we have a shared aspiration to maximize uh, coverage, whether it be in the exchange, um, with or without tax credits, the Medi-Cal program, or healthy families. So in terms of um, the work we are undertaking together, uh, we have a contractor, Ogilvy Worldwide, uh, with a whole array of partners that they've brought to the table um, that working with the exchange, healthcare services, and Mr. Mid, we're developing a very, very comprehensive campaign, frankly. Um, one of the messages is very, very clear. 
um, which is we have um, a lot of work to do. We have a diversity of populations to reach. And there is no one strategy that's going to work. And those of you who are involved in providing leadership at the county level, at the community level, know how critical it is that the exchange and its partners advance a very multifaceted, comprehensive, uh, and sustained um, campaign. Second, we are spending time really digging into existing programs that the state has developed over time, as well as the counties. But we know in the absence of comprehensive universal coverage, our state policymakers have said, well, let's, let's have a program just for pregnant women. And let's have a program for family planning services. And let's have a program for breast and cervical cancer treatment. All extraordinarily important and reflective of policymakers' priorities in the context of a lot of people who are uninsured. Well, with the Affordable Care Act and near universal comprehensive coverage, we have an opportunity to identify those populations and to the extent they're el eligible, facilitate their enrollment effective 2014 so that they can move from limited coverage to comprehensive coverage. So we're looking at ways to kind of do pre-enrollment. We're also looking at uh, what we call transitional strategies. For example, as children come into the Healthy Families Program, what do we know about their parents? We've got 900,000 kids in healthy families. My expectation is a fair number of those parents with incomes less than 250% of poverty may very well be uninsured. And here's an opportunity to bring them into coverage out of the blocks come 2014, which is a good thing for them, and it's a good thing for the exchange in terms of building a broad uh, risk mix. Individual assistance. We understand it's not all about getting online. You know That may work for some people, but for a lot of people it won't work. And so individual assistance through call centers, through community-based organizations, through agents and brokers are going to be critical partners. And so we're working with our, our contractors and really scoping out. So you know, who should play this role of, you've heard the term navigator. Navigators are really going to be the on-the-ground assisters to help connect people to information about coverage and facilitate um, their enrollment and do so in a way that is consistent with the cultural and linguistic diversity of the people we're, we're endeavoring to, to reach. So who, who will be assisters? What are the scope of their responsibilities? How will we structure compensation? Um, what are some of the accountability measures we'll, we'll want to monitor? Um, stakeholder engagement. We are not operating in a vacuum, whether it be through our, our meetings that we hold in public, whether it be the stakeholder processes uh, we have undertaken, uh, whether it be through our website where we post uh, in the context of this, this program, for example. Uh, we went out uh, around California communities. We posted questions to really inform the board and staff's understanding about some of the key decision points that we need to be making around outreach, enrollment, uh, and retention in this Navigator uh, program. Uh, and finally, technology. Uh, technology may not be the most uh, sexy of, of terms but, uh, and issues, but it is among the most consequential and complicated. And so in partnership with health services and uh, Mr. Mib, we've moved forward with something called the CalEARS program, the California Health, Education, Eligibility, and Retention System, uh, which is the IT infrastructure, which will also include that, that front end kind of public facing website um, that uh, assisters and individuals directly will use to, to connect to coverage and the information they need. Uh, and finally, CalEARS will include a provider directory, uh, which we know when you, you reach out to people and solicit what information about what do they care most about. They really care about their doctor. And right now, many websites, if not most, it makes it really, really hard to find out. You've got to go plan to plan to see if your physician or providers you care about are in them. Our vision is to create a directory that starts with the provider and then connects to the plans uh, that that individual um, uh, is in. The second area of major decisions um, I, I want to touch on before uh, inviting your, your comments and questions is around benefit design and plan choices. So if we're successful in getting people to the door through outreach and education, through the eligibility determination process uh, with the support of assisters and an information technology system that is reliable and timely and accurate, um, and uh, uh, we're able to provide customer-centered, consumer-centered decision support tools to get them enrolled in a plan, you know, once we get them to that point, the question is, so what are the choices that are going to be made available to them? And so here, the Exchange Board is grappling with, with two kind of overarching questions. Number one is, what are the products we need to make available that people are going to want to buy that offer them value in terms of the, the providers, in terms of the benefits, in terms of the cost, in terms of the quality? 
So number one, what, what products do we need to make available to encourage consumers to come to the exchange to purchase uh, their insurance? And secondly, how do we purchase health care benefits? Again, we're an active purchaser. How do we purchase health care benefits um, to provide the maximum value for the health care dollar that we're spending? So this slide highlights some very, very important um, issues that a, a bullet and a few comments cannot give justice to, but kind of a top line on each of them. So first is health benefits. I think I'll speak for myself. I was expecting the federal government to say these are the health, essential health benefits, the EHBs for all of the people of the land. And um, recall that a centerpiece of reform, not the only critical piece, but an important component of reform is the requirement that individuals buy insurance. Right? So the goal is near universal coverage. Federal law says to insurance companies, you've got to cover everyone regardless of their medical condition, their pre-existing uh, health status, their gender, their occupation. So policymakers said insurers, you got to cover everyone who comes through your door. And policymakers said, and you, individuals, have to take responsibility for purchasing insurance, not just when you're not well, but when you're healthy, because we want that broad risk pool. We all benefit by everyone being in that risk pool. If the federal government is going to say everyone needs to buy insurance, government then needs to define, well, what meets that minimum? You know, What meets that mandate? And so federal law directed the Secre Federal Secretary of Health and Human Services to define essential health benefits. In December, the federal government issued a bulletin that took some by surprise, which effectively said to the states, you decide. And here's a framework for your consideration of what essential health benefits will be in your state. And so there's a number of choices from which state policymakers will choose. These are state benchmark plans. It's looking at what are the most popular plans sold through our state employees program, CalPERS. What are the most popular pro, uh, plans um, sold in the small group market, and so forth. We've done some analysis of those essential health benefits, those, those benchmark plans for California, and they're really very similar. So we haven't found much um, variation, um, either in terms of benefits covered or the cost of those benefits across the different plans. So the question for California's exchange board is going to be probably not so much about what benefits are covered, though I would expect we will spend some time looking at where some adjustments or tweaking may need to occur. And we'll also have to talk about if those are benefits in excess of our, these 10 different benchmark plans. The state may have to contribute general fund to pay for that. But generally, when we think about our discretion, where the variability is, it's not going to be in the, what benefits are covered. So we're going to have to th think through, so what should we take into account as we think about benefit design? How do we think about cost sharing, for example? How do we think about provider network? How do we think about premiums and cost? How do we think about care management features? So those are some of the considerations around benefit design that we're going to need to be working through. I know I bring a, a keen interest in benefit design from the perspective of really wanting to understand where the opportunities are for benefit design, to be, benefits to be structured in a way to really encourage, to reward individuals to more actively participate in, in their health and their well-being, and to take advantage of what we know through the evidence to be evidence-based practices that really can um, help, the, uh, help improve wellness, particularly those individuals who have, have chronic diseases. A second set of decisions we're going to need to make is not only so what benefit, what's the benefit design look like, but what, what plans are going to be offering the, those, those benefits. This is this issue I touched on at the opening uh, of my comments in terms of the state exchange board's ability to establish state participation standards um, to, that reflect California's goals, California's priorities. So the question for the board here is, so what criteria should we use for determining, to, for determining those priorities. Should we, for example, place a, a high priority on qualified health plans demonstration um, of their ability to assure culturally and linguistically uh, competent services, um, which I would anticipate will be very high value for the exchange, given the diversity of the people eligible um, for coverage. Um, should we look at um, their uh, ability, the evidence that they can bring of their ability to support and encourage healthy lifestyles and to ensure um, the provision of recommended um, clinical services? Um, should we look at their ability to really gather data and, and understand the risk profile of the people they serve and use, demonstrate the ability to use that information to 
target care coordination and chronic disease management cert programs. So, you know, very important conversation that we as a community are having, uh, are having and will continue to have for the next couple months about what criteria we should put at the forefront um, for planned participation standards. Uh, relatedly is this question of, 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 of choice. Um, thinking through what is our strategy for determining the optimum number and types of qualified health plans that we will offer to really maximize value for consumers? Um, what's the optimum number um, in terms of facilitating the ability of consumers uh, to make a meaningful comparison, to make a meaningful choice? Some have said, you know, look at the prescription Part, uh, part D Medicare prescription drug benefit. You know, that's an example of too much choice being a bad thing. Others have said, no, it's really not, you can never have too much choice. It's all about having the right kind of decision support tools. So what, what is the right number? What is the right balance if our goal is really to empower consumers uh, to make a meaningful uh, comparison and make a decision that reflects their priorities? How do we think about the number and type of offerings in the context of what the exchange puts on its shelf relative to what the Medi-Cal program offers to Medi-Cal enrollees? Because we all know people in this income range are not static. There's a lot of volatility. So someone can be Medi-Cal eligible today and exchange tax credit eligible tomorrow. They can be employer eligible today and exchange tax credit eligible tomorrow. So we need to be thinking about the product offerings across the, the continuum. Uh, finally, delivery system reform. As I noted, we have an aspiration. Um, it's not just about coverage, as important as that is. Um, it's about looking for ways to use our purchasing clout in the marketplace to really drive delivery system improvements. Uh, we dedicated an entire board meeting in February to this issue, these issues around selection and certification of qualified health plans. And we got a whole array of, uh, uh, a diverse array of advice. Um, but the overarching message was we got to figure out a way to balance um, the, the need on the one hand to provide consumers with choice and to promote healthy competition among plans um, with the opportunity to use our purchasing power to really drive certain characteristics and competencies among qualified health plans that we know offer significant promise in terms of improving quality and reducing costs. You know, as we see these evolving models of care, such as accountable care organizations and other types of delivery and financing arrangements that really place a very high value on quality improvement and affordability, some of were advising us saying, out of the blocks, be bold and say, this is all you want to buy and you're only going to contract with health plans that possess certain types of characteristics around care coordination and team-based patient-centered care. So some very difficult and important issues there. Uh, and finally, we'll, we're beginning a conversation around, so what's it going to cost to operate an exchange on a go-forward basis? As I noted, come 2015, we have to be fully self-supporting. And um, the expectation is that the financing uh, of that, uh, those operations will be through an assessment on the qualified health plans that participate. And by extension, that means by the, the enrollees. So ensuring that that, that uh, assessment is as, as modest as possible to maximize the, the goal of affordability. Um, I've noted on the bottom uh, uh, our website address, which I'll return to in, in just a moment. Um, but we, um, as I said, are in a process, both through our uh, uh, board meetings, uh, working through these issues around benefit um, design and uh, qualified health plan certification uh, and selection. Uh, we have posted uh, roughly 40 questions. We are not expecting anyone to answer all 40, but if you have opinions and evidence on all 40, we're eager for your thoughts. Um, but we uh, would encourage those of you who care about these issues um, to uh, go to our website and provide um, your feedback. Um, finally, we are not operating in isolation here. We have contracted with Price uh, Waterhouse Coopers, and they are our contracting partner um, that are helping us really undertake the very rigorous and comprehensive thinking and analysis and outreach uh, to inform the board's thinkings around uh, standards and processes for QHP uh, selection. Um, once we uh, uh, certify and select what the ongoing uh, program is going to look like, uh, helping us think through our timelines and processes and going back to timelines, as I noted earlier, if we open um, our doors, uh, effective uh, and coverage begins January 1 of 2014, that means we need to make choices available um, to consumers in the fall of 2013. In order to do that, that means we need to um, have um, uh, choices available 
uh, to people roughly in the spring of next year. Uh, so, or summer of next year, which means we have to make decisions in terms of selecting those qualified health plans by the spring of next year, which means we have to have a solicitation on the street um, for qualified health plan selection by this fall. So that's a very, very ambitious timeline, but um, critical to meeting our open the doors January 1, 2014 um, uh, deadline. Uh, and finally, we're looking to Price Waterhouse Coopers and, and through this um, broad uh, public process to, to give us their best thinking um, on delivery system improvement strategies. Again, consistent with that, that aspiration to be a, a catalyst for change. Um, I'd close with um, some final thoughts in terms of how we do our work. Um, we are, as I noted earlier, very cognizant of the fact that we are not an island unto ourselves. Uh, we are part of this broader fabric and that, that sense of, of community, that ecosystem um, is fundamental as it relates to the state exchanges roles and responsibilities in partnership uh, with our public partners, um, principally healthcare services and Mr. Mid, but also uh, CalPERS and, and other, uh, other partners. Uh, we have been very much committed as a board and uh, staff to evidence-based decision making. Um, so you will hear us consistently um, talk about our commitment to uh, uh, research, to information, to evidence, to undergird and inform the work that we do. Um, and, and finally, the issue of stakeholder consultation and engagement. Um, we are different from a lot of public uh, entities because we do do our work in public uh, session. Um, anyone who watches our meetings, um, I think gets a, a very good sense of how, um, uh, how seriously we take our work, um, but how we are really thinking out loud together about some profoundly uh, profoundly important decisions uh, and issues that will affect the health of um, our, our state residents. Um, encourage you to come, go to our website, encourage you to uh, uh, sign up for our listserv. Um, it's uh, a very rich conversation we are having as a, as a group um, of people who care about our state and its future. And um, I, I would just note before uh, inviting your comments and questions, um, this is a time of extraordinary uh, uncertainty. And um, I, for one, am glad to be in a state where notwithstanding that uncertainty, we are moving forward. We are moving forward thoughtfully, deliberately, and transparently. And my expectation is that everyone, everyone in this room who came to a conversation to learn more about the exchange, to learn more about health reform, in some way, shape, or form, is a part of the effort to improve health for the people of California. And that is, this is why I do what I do. It's why you do what you do. And we have a remarkable opportunity before us um, to advance long overdue improvements in terms of coverage, in terms of access, in terms of health equity, in terms of quality and cost. But it's not just about the exchange. It's not just about the, uh, the, the, the state. It's really about all of us. Um, so we're eager for your partnership. We're eager for your participation. Uh, and working together, I, I really am confident, notwithstanding the big issues looming large with the campaigns and the courts, the issues that gave rise to the Affordable Care Act endure. They persist. They have real implications for California. And we all have a responsibility to do what we can to, to tackle them and contribute to a healthier California. So thank you for your partnership. And let's hear uh, what you have to say.